And we're back. Wait a minute. Oh, never mind. We're back. And we had last week off because it's summer. It's the busy season for everyone, for everything. It's not quite as busy as we would maybe like it to be, but it's busy enough. It's busy enough. Anyway. We were out of state. Yeah, and we'll get to that. That was exciting. Um, So it's just your humble host, John Dayton here, bringing you the Smart to Noise Ratio Pro Audio Podcast. This is episode number 11. And uh, I have with me here tonight, we're in the spacious backyard of one Mr. Anthony Kazabucky. Hello there. Out by the fire pit, getting ready for some festivities later tonight. So uh, before I head out, I'm helping a buddy strike a gig today, and I was in the dimmer rack all afternoon, so this is, this is pleasant. So I've got my feet up on a stump, <laughs> the breeze is blowing, the traffic is breezing by, none of it is my concern, I am just here to talk about audio for the next little bit. So, uh, yeah, while we're getting warmed up, this is actually, it seems like an age ago, but uh, Anthony and I went to, <laughs> Anthony and I went to um, Philly this last week, <laughs> got a call, uh, and this is just one of those cool things, like, you couldn't, lo- you, you couldn't buy your way into a gig like this, it just had, had to fall out of the sky. Uh, got a call about a week in advance, actually less than a week in advance, from a woman who was not in a total panic, but she was... She was in dire need. And she was pretty stressed. She was pretty stressed. She was not panicking, though, because theater people, good ones, do not panic. Uh, so anyway, uh, friends of my cousin, John, who lives down in the New York metropolitan area and had been an actor. Now he's doing other things, but still has a lot of actory friends. Um, she was... Uh, actually, I don't know what her actual role is, but anyway, she had, she had booked... Uh, her, her troop into this uh, corporate dinner event. I guess I'd to lay it out a little bit. It's called the Water Coolers, and they've kind of always done this sort of thing for corporate events. They had run off Broadway. Uh, they've run, you know, they have like an hour, hour and a half, two hour long. I think it's an hour and an hour and fifteen hour, half an hour. Yeah, hour. so they've they've got a full run show that they use that they do in a theatrical setting and have done in I think five different cities. Yep. Uh, in addition to New York, they've they've licensed it. But what they've got is you know a company of actors who some of them just do this, some of them do day jobs and this, some of them, most of them probably do other acting gigs and this. And when they get a booking, they put it out there and they get a cast together of four to six people and they go out and do songs. Uh, the easiest way to picture it is if you watch The Office, uh, if The Office were a musical. That's, yep. uh, that's the thing. And cool thing about it is they've actually got a really strong staff of writers. Uh, some of the actors write, but they, they have some writers that are uh, sort of always in that position. And they'll actually call up, like the one we did was for uh, Vanguard Capital or Financial. Financial, yeah, something like that. And their writers had gone in and talked to you know people in the company, and they did three full verses of, I'm the very model of a modern major general, but it was all in-house acronyms. So if your financial advisor says it's, 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 it's and, Some, something relating to Vanguard. And yeah. It's, it's, it's situation tailored. Mm-hmm. So whoever, whoever the booking company is ends up telling them, you know, the, the writer, I think his name's Tom. One we'll of get, them, yeah. Yeah. One of the writers, he'll, uh, he'll get some details about, you know, certain different things that they talk about in the company and then write it into a song, which is, you know, I, I think their, their closing number was an adapted version of In the Navy. Yeah. Here at Vanguard. Oh, yeah. And then it was, yeah. you know, inserts financial industry jargon here. And and uh, it was weird because the audience was like an oil painting. They were they were busy making big deals and, and, and whatnot. <laughs> sucking down wine. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, it was clearly the end of the convention, and they just wanted their steak and, and complimentary beverages and to GTFO. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't ask your parents what that stands for, kids. Yeah, please. So that was where we came in. Um, she asked me if I could do it. I was like, well, you know, usually I've got a rehearsal that night, but as luck would have it, my rehearsal had been moved that week. And I said, well, you know, okay. Put the offer out there, and uh, actually everybody I know wanted to go, including my wife, who actually had come up with places for the children to stay. <laughs> uh, it wound up not working out, though. So hey, Anthony joined me for the trip, and we, uh, let me see. Six and a half hour drive down. Yeah, we, we arose bright and early. I think we were vertical slightly after 5.30, on the road before 6. Six and a half hours down on a 100 degree day with no AC. <laughs> so by the time we got there... A lot of Motley crew. Going. We actually didn't listen to the radio that much on the way down. We, it was the last hour. Like yeah. I, We were watching the temperature creep up, and we, we don't, despite you know working five miles from each other, we actually don't see a ton of each other. So we were... <laughs> Just sort of driving in silence for a while, and then as we woke up, uh, talking about the gig and just talking about stuff, and we actually, we were joking, we should have flipped out the laptop and recorded it, because we had some 
glorious insights about guitar playing and all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. That uh, the last hour was really wretched. That's when we, we busted out the, the hair metal and the obnoxious hip hop, and, and it was just. But so we had Flight of the Concords. If you guys haven't listened to Flight of the Concords, mm. go go on YouTube that because it's um, you enjoy it a lot more when you work in it a lot. It's uh, a couple guys from New Zealand. Um, Ki- Kiwi rap. Kiwi rap. Right. It was uh, it was a show. They were actually the third most popular folk group in New Zealand or something like that. And they they had an HBO show for a while and. Uh, Joey introduced me to it actually, and that burned out a lot of my recording time with Joe. But, <laughs> but um, it, it's 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 good stuff to kind of let your mind rest a little bit when you're when you're just fed up with an artist or <laughs> recording or anything like that. It kind of it, it it gets your mind off. But. So we got there, and from having the windows down at seventy miles an hour for several hours, my left ear was shot. And Anthony's right ear was shot, so we agreed to, you know, tuning the system, we were going to stand... Back to back. Yeah, back to back, opposite from the way we had sat in the car, and he would have a good left ear, and I'd have a good right ear, and we'd, we'd kind of pan around the room and sort things out. Um, but interesting thing was that uh, it was just a walk-in and mix gig. I did bring a couple of pieces, because they didn't have their rig fully fit out. They had been, for the last 12 years, relying on the client and or the venue to provide a system and a tech and had sort of taken this opportunity to go ahead and invest in stuff. So they, they bought some big JBL three-way three yeah. self-powered, and they had that JBL sound, but they really weren't bad. They were clear. Um, they're, they're nice for drunk people because when, when you start drinking, your ears compress above, like, 3K. Mm-hmm. They just cut right through. They did. So, yeah, we, we didn't tame them down as much as we could have. Um, but they were, they were working nice. They were cutting through the, the, the room. Weird room, too. It was a former steel foundry. But it had been very nicely updated and also very well insulated, which yeah. was cool. Um, so we had no issues with bounce. It was a very dead room, sound shot right into the back. Uh, so yeah, we, we met these people. Ten minutes later, we had our hands on their gear, unboxing it, literally. I mean, it had they, showed up. They had from, just gotten They had just ordered all this stuff from B&H and, uh, and came in the box. They had a little uh, Allen and Heath 16-2 mix whiz. Gorgeous little console. Uh, nice, nice mic pre's in it. Uh, worth worth a lot more than you pay for it. It really honestly. is. It's it's greater than the sum of its parts. It had it had built-in effects, which didn't suck. Like the reverb was okay. Mm-hmm. We didn't get into much other than just just a touch on the keyboard. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it really did. It filled out really nice. I had a touch on the vocals too. Not okay. probably not. I could hear it in my cans. Oh, and that was the next development. Was I had thought that maybe things would go this way, having seen a floor plan in advance, that maybe I would not get to mix from the house. So it was really imperative that I have somebody with a good set of ears there, which is why I brought Anthony and not one of the younger guys, although there are a couple college age guys that work with us that uh, in the... in got the, some good ears on them. Yeah, in the future, like once we've got a couple of these under our belts, I, I would be confident to send them out solo, but uh, it was really nice. We, you know, we, they were kind of doing warm-ups and working through some stuff. We threw up monitors for them, checked their mics out, and we're, we're just walking the room, making some subtle adjustments, but then at go time, I had to stick right to the side of the stage. I mean, that's where the mix was. So we threw on two-way radios, popped in earpieces, and uh, it was weird. I mean, we, we drove all this way, and it was a 10-minute <laughs> teaser as people were sort of at the sitting buffet down, and sitting yeah. down. And then we let them eat for an hour and then came back and did a 15-minute piece. Closer yeah. session, yeah. So, uh, but it was awesome. I mean, I, just, I stood there with the cans on, so, like, I, I had a good relative mix going for myself. I could sort of tell who was out of balance or whatever and then anthony would make calls from out in the house like you know uh you know the girl's not punching through turn the gray suit up a little you know whatever so got through that re- nicely and uh anthony and i are now able to add to our resumes that we have mixed a show via two-way radio which not everybody can claim we can we can do we've got that on our resume as well as mixing via text that yep. was uh well with, with my wife have mixed by text remotely <laughs> yep and I'm just I'm waiting to do one by IP. If I can do one by chat, I feel like that'll be the hat trick for me. And then I'm just going to stop showing up to gigs. I will literally be phoning it in. Shotgun mic in the house and uh, just just make sure the delay is not too bad. Just send me the feed. I'll <laughs> I'll mix remotely. Uh, so did that, and then we had an hour to wait because they they didn't really want us hustling around striking while people were you know while the high muckety mucks were finishing their cocktails. So we popped off to the corner, ran up to the pub, and 30 seconds behind us were the actors and the producer. Right. And uh, just let, we let them buy us drinks, and it, it was it was pretty neat to, to hear some of the backstories from the kids. One of the because uh, there there were for this particular show there were three main actors and a keyboardist narrator type kid, 
um, the keyboardist, who's the narrator, had just come off of his third run on Broadway of Les Mis. So it's it's not like your community theater type people. Like these these are legitimate actors mm -hmm. that could actually sing, actually act. Like they, one of uh, one of the actors, I think actually the lead, hadn't ever he'd done the show before, but not this version of it. So in the 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 forty five minutes that we were setting up, um, ringing out stuff, they ran through. He learned all of his parts and was was dead on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this, this was the first time that that particular company had ever been together in the same room. They did one run through and then did the show. <laughs> it got it got a little bit difficult because I had, I had started dressing the lead actor's glasses and uh, he didn't wear them. He didn't wear the glasses, <laughs> <laughs> so we, we went by suit color. And thank God John's not colorblind. Um, <clears throat> there's there's the chick and the two guys and the piano player and I mean they they've all done actual Broadway stuff like. If you go online and look up the water coolers, um, the the clip that John has posted on the blog, uh, one of the chicks is actually the one that we worked with, the uh, the ginger type one. Um, <clears throat> but she's fantastic. She she fit the role perfectly. And I I personally, I'm not a big fan of musical theater. Um, I'm a rock guy. Um, I'm, I'm more of a live music type guy. And uh, John grew up more not grew up but worked more theater type events uh, getting into it than I have but I, I actually enjoyed it a lot and it was it, it was fun to, to be outside of my comfort zone a little bit um, and, and see where you know it's it's a lot different than watching a movie play out or, or a, <clears throat> a rock show it's, it's got a different type of atmosphere that you really need to learn how to cater to before you can get into it and I thankfully had <laughs> had enough on the back end to, to catch up with it. Yep. Yeah, there's something I don't I don't feel ashamed at all admitting that I like show tunes because you know well written stuff is you know emotional in uh, completely across the range and in that is generally usually very clever and you know wordy and uh, I just I love I love plays on words and and seldom used words and things like that and that just all comes out in musical theater. Uh, unlikely rhymes, you know, like yep. e even in a in a really heart wrenching number, you, you'll catch some some somebody figures out how to rhyme with orange, and and, and carry it on from and, there for another two or three verses. Yeah, just, and make you chuckle in the middle of a, a heartthrob number. Right. So uh, so it was that was really great. I've, I have done a bunch of high school, community, local theater, um, and all very good stuff. I mean, some of it with, with pretty good sized budgets. I mean, I've done community theater with a sixty thousand dollar budget before. And in those casts have been some people who have gone on to do great things, or, or even they haven't. Like, just there has been some really good talent. But instead of being the one telling the people, like, oh, yeah, this is this is how it is in theater because you haven't really done any before. And, right, yeah. You know, these are the jokes you make, and this is the camaraderie you have. It, it was really cool to, to just be sitting across from people who were steeped in that at the highest level and, and yeah. accepted us. You know, like, we, it, you know, we were able to prove ourselves to them right off the bat, and... You know, made everybody comfortable, and so that, what was nice was you know within uh, we didn't really get to hang out with the actors until about At that the bar. Yeah, yeah. That forty-five minutes when we were sipping iced tea. I was sipping an iced tea anyway. Mm. Um, <laughs> iced in do air quotes when you say iced tea. <laughs> yeah, it was too hot for ice. The ice gave up pretty quick. But uh, you know, we had, we just had that forty-five minutes and, and became fast friends immediately. Um, yep. You know, it's uh, hanging out with people that are cut from the same cloth. It's it's like you you're getting back together with friends that you yeah. It, 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 and especially like you, you've done a lot more theater than I have. Um, you know, I, I do the the Eastern Christmas play at the church, which doesn't count because we we write that garbage, and I know all the people that are singing it and playing it, and it's it, it wears out pretty quick. But when you've got people that actually, you know, that's that's their livelihood. It's 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 the same type of thing like running sound at a church on Sundays and Saturdays and during the week. That's that's how we feed our families. Um, and this is how they feed their families, and, and it's not as far off as you think it is. And it's you know, especially from from me, I've I've always not necessarily looked down, but it, it's it's a different environment. My my wife went to school for musical theater and music business and all that stuff, and um, she's got a great degree and uh, from SUNY Oneonta for for that type of stuff. But at the same time, I I just don't understand it. I grew up. You know, my, the first time I, I really listened to music, my dad made fun of me for listening to the radio. He's like, what? Cut, cut that out. And he put on ZZ Top's Eliminator album. And I listened to Legs for a, a, a good hour and just had to figure out how to drag a needle into place just so I keep listening to Legs. But um, it's, 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 a nice, it's a nice spread of, of learning 
the, the clientele that you can work with and that they're not that bad. Um, I mean, it, it's a lot different than being outside of a church or being outside of a certain rock venue where, you know, th these people understand where you're coming from. They're, they're doing the same thing as you. They're, they're providing, they're, they're doing what they need to do, but they're doing it on stage. You're just doing it behind the stage. Yep. And it's the, it's their vocation, which makes it easier. And they're not stars. I mean, they're working at the very highest level that there is in their industry, but they're still just getting up and going to a job. And if that, you know, they're, it's, and it's constantly it's, changing and right, going to different it, gigs it's not the same Motley Crue show that you've been seeing for the last, I don't know, whatever, since you did that sex tape. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, which is not to say that there aren't, you know, divas in the industry, but I think really for the most part, <laughs> most people aren't. I mean, they may right. be a little gun shy, maybe a little, <laughs> you know, distant or cold because they've been bitten by bad techs. But, you know, or, if you can reassure people that you are a good one, then, you know, they're, yeah. they're pretty quick to open up. Fit right in. It, it's, it goes, I, we've, we've written a lot of pieces, John mostly has written a lot of pieces about being really open to <clears throat> what, what the artist needs. And that's, that's a big part about what we do. Like it's, it's not entry level. It's above that, but it's not, you know, you, you're not getting booked to do a, a 50 show European tour with the Chili Peppers. You know, you're, you're not Dave Rapp, but there's, there's a certain approach that you have to have to, to really connect with these type of people and, and these type of artists where everybody kind of helps each other out. You know, if they, they can't hear something on stage, they're not just going to whine about it. They'll tell you like, Hey, listen, I need, I need more of Greg in the right fill and, and not the left fill, but all that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's nice to see people in this type of industry working together as opposed to just working at each other. And speaking of working at the highest level, uh, it was, I mean, I run side stage monitor mix sometimes. So I, I am used to, feeling my work and watching the performers uh, because you know if you've done your job well they don't need anything from you they're set right. but you know things change you know maybe they've had a couple of beers and their hair yeah. changed or you people know. in the room the humidity like all that kind of stuff you work in an indoor outdoor stage it's yep. and the energy's different once right. once the curtain finally goes up uh, so I'm used to you know when I am side stage I, I put my hands on where they need to be and kind of just feel my way around the console and watch the actors and it was so cool just catching a couple eye rolls about the, like, you know, they would do a, a big line and their choreography would have them like turning around and marching up stage sort of towards me. And they'd all look over at me and just roll the eyes. <laughs> uh, big giant WTF. What, what are we doing here? No one gives a flying fill in your four letter word. Yep. Um, and, and also too, like just on a technical level to, uh, like apart from those little comical moments of them, like, kind of like, Oh, we're dying out here. But you know, to, to catch a, a quick glance from the girl, you know, like made, millisecond eye contact with me and then did like a double dart at the piano player with her eyes and I read, you know, like, oh yeah, I got that for you, babe. Turn, yeah. <laughs> Two more points of piano in the wedges? Yes, got I can it. do that. Yep. Roger. So it was it was cool to be immediately, you know, trusted like that and, uh, you know, that, I think being, little, able, being able to pick up on that kind of stuff because it's, I mean, I don't know, on Sunday mornings, like, we our, our practice for our Sunday morning services is on Thursday nights, so You'll kind of you'll you'll get a nice you know you can stop in the middle of the song and say hey I need a little bit more of this in the wedge or a little bit more in the ears, all that kind of stuff. But to almost instantaneously with uh, maybe a forty five minute pseudo rehearsal on our belts be able to read somebody like that. That's to me that that embraces a higher caliber of actor um, and, and performer than anything else. Like if you can communicate that on your first try to your tech. It just, it, it makes a world of difference. It's just, it makes everything run smoother. Everybody's happy on the show. You don't have me and John going to the bar and be like, some, you owe me at least six beers. <laughs> there have been a lot of those. In fact, we're going to get to some of that a little later in the show. But, um, so yeah, and then, you know, from, from there, I think we've gushed about that enough. From there, we wound up going back to the hotel. And the plan was initially, I mean, you know, they had very nicely gotten a hotel room for us, which we did make some use of. I uh, think that that's the nicest hotel room I've ever been in. <laughs> it was pretty swank. Uh, what was it? A uh, Mar Marriott, Marriott Court? Courtyard. Yeah, buddy. With, oh, my gosh. I, I walked in the room, and I was like, oh, every, every Led Zeppelin album that I've ever listened to is just telling me to rip this thing to shreds and that if the windows open there wouldn't be a tv and all that kind of stuff but they they were great about it you know we showed up and um they didn't have our names on the list and our room wasn't ready and stuff and we're like oh crap we're gonna smell like balls by the time we get to the show people are just gonna be you know not not just us giving us or us giving dirty glances but people just be like i don't want to go anywhere near that because they smell they smell like a seven hour car ride in 100 degree heat you know and it really it literally was 100 <laughs> we, we have photographic proof. yeah 
<laughs> so yeah, we we at least got four very nice showers. And, well, Anthony managed to catch a couple of naps, but yeah, I mean, yeah. this place was so nice that the paintings weren't actually bolted to the wall. It was that swank. Um, but anyway, we you know the idea was to to you know go back, catch a shower, get right on the road because we both had stuff to do the next day, and they were yeah. all like, "Whoa!" Yeah, we 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 <laughs> finished up. Well, I finished with, we finished loading out. Got to uh, got back to the hotel. You know, we we powered through loadout and packed up their gear, packed up our gear. I think we were on the road by like nine forty five at the latest. latest. Got back to the hotel, and the hotel bar closed at ten. But we called early, and they said, "Oh, well, if you're from the Foundry, then we'll we'll keep it open for a bit." So they kept it open until like eleven thirty or twelve for us. Mm-hmm. And uh, the uh, the lady that John had initially talked to called and ordered us, you know, a little uh, artisan type pizza and some quesadillas and stuff like that. So. We got once we got back. I, I desperately needed a shower. I, there's there's no deodorant on the planet that counters what I put out. There just <laughs> isn't. Um, short of Botox, really. So you know, I went up, grabbed a shower real quick, came back down, had a few drinks, and probably the meanest bloody mary I've ever had in my entire life. <laughs> it's uh, it was three quarters Tabasco, a shot of tomato juice, and some <laughs> celery in a glass with some vodka. <laughs> and the vodka was pretty nervous. Yeah, it, understand. Was, it, was, it wasn't too happy to be in that class. It was a little afraid. <laughs> so anyway, we wound up jawboning with these guys for a couple hours. And again, like these are people that travel the world doing this. You know, and they're they're talking about you know being in Singapore, being in London. I mean, and this is all on the same weekend, right? Yeah, and, and they they used to. I think they they were saying they were in Vegas doing shows the MGM and uh, a couple of the other big places three four times a week. The uh, the writer that we were with, at least his name is Tom. He was, at the time, back in the day, probably four or five years ago, he was one of two or three voiceover guys mm-hmm. in New York City. And that's, like, if, if you're not in it, well, I didn't understand how tight it was to get in just the voiceover thing. Um, I, I've tried for a while to get into voiceover in Buffalo, and it's just... There's two guys, one union, one non-union. Right, yeah, <laughs> and, and the non-union guy gets a lot of work, and the other guy raises a lot of hell. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> like, be, being able to be in the same room with these, you know, I... I consider myself a, a touch above amateur. I've been on the road. I've done a lot of stuff, but it's not, you know, this is my first real, well, pseudo real theater gig. And they, they took me in like I was family. Like I've been on the road with them for a while. And it's, it's, it's nice to get that kind of acceptance right off the bat, you know, for, for doing a good job, doing what you're supposed to do and helping out who you're supposed to help out, not just being a dick and saying, no, Mm-hmm. No, I can't give you more 2.5k in your wedges because I don't feel like spinning that knob. You know, don't you think I know what I'm doing? Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. Not that we're forever <laughs> about that, but it was it was cool to not only just to be accepted, but when the story time, you know, like it, you know, they were just really personal and turned to us. They're like, so what do, you, what do you guys do? What do you, what cool stories do you got? And then when it, when it came to, you know, it's it's time to go to bed. Uh, you know, and they're all heading upstairs and they're gonna head out sometime tomorrow. Like, yeah, we got a jettison where you know we got a. He and I both had to, like he had to be back at work. <laughs> by, at, the, by the time we pulled into John's house, I had thirty minutes, which is the exact car ride that I had to get back to work <laughs> because we've downsized. So as as opposed to just doing lighting and sound and the video stuff, because our video guys are tired. Um, uh, I had to I had to water plants. We just built a new building and uh, had to water some plants and. <laughs> putting some more bushes and all kinds of stuff and weed whack the place. It's a decent sized campus. Our, our sanctuary holds about 800 and we've got three services on Sunday. So it's, it's a, it's a decent sized task. So coming off of that, you just, the zombie apocalypse is real and it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be run by a ones and a twos. <laughs> yeah. I'm not worried about my family. I'll just cut the, cut the zombies to bits with my Leatherman. But then I had to, I had a, he had, so he had to be in at 8 AM. I had till basically whenever I wanted, but I, I knew how much stuff I had to do and I had a rehearsal that night. So I also had uh, a commencement coming in because a lot of local schools use our, you know, we have a 1400 seat venue. They use our place. So I had to get ready for a packed house and I don't know, I had to touch 40 lighting units and prep the sound system and strike the stage. And then the eyebrows went up all around the circle. I was like, yeah, and then I got to run a rehearsal and then turn it around and do church for (laughs) 1800 people this weekend. And they're like, Holy oh. crap. <laughs> uh, we're just going to go home and drink some more. <laughs> <laughs> so that was fun to be able to turn the tables and, and make them ooh and ah a little bit about we, what we were doing. And then, so we got on the road at midnight. And, uh, yeah, Google Maps had three distinctly different ways to go. <laughs> and we, oddly enough, the fastest one was the most wretched. We, we took the second fastest to get there. And it was like, I don't know, six hours and 45 minutes. The fast one was 6.33 or something like that. But it yep. took us down... 
and I, this won't make a bit of sense if you're not from the area, but if you've ever driven up Route 15 in Pennsylvania, uh, PA 15 is one of the most wretched stretches of highway on this godforsaken planet. It, it and I will go toe to toe with anybody <laughs> who is not willing to say that it's at least in the top 10. Because and and we drove it at just the absolute worst time. I mean, yeah. there was no traffic, but we were in the mountains of PA on a stretch of road that the speed limit changes every six inches, and it's foggy. <laughs> and if yeah, if you don't have fog lights, you're screwed. I I think John drove or no, I drove. I, I drove every hour of it except the the one hour because Anthony had to be up way earlier than I did. So uh, he got to sleep at the hotel and he got to sleep all he wanted in the car. And when I was about to drive into a pine tree, I made him drive <laughs> at we, 5 a.m. We, we woke up at a truck stop somewhere. What, what, what the hell is this? <laughs> we, what state are we in? We're Ohio. in New York. What? Oh. Oh. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah. But he, we, he had to drive <laughs> the worst hour of the entire trip. So said all that to say this, we, we got through it all, had an amazing experience, and I got, it actually hasn't come through yet, it's a direct deposit thing, it's taken a minute to set up. I was going to ask about that, I'm, you gas my car. Ah, uh, sorry. Yeah. I'm, uh, <laughs> actually, I'm, I might be, able, yeah, I can, I can take care of you. Yeah. See me? <laughs> <laughs> after the, after the broadcast. Yeah, talk to the, talk to my butler after we finish oh. here. Um, yeah, they, they are getting ready to direct deposit to me a dump truck load of money and I'm not going to say how much it was but you know she asked me what it would be to do this and I'm like well geez I mean if you were my buddy in the next town over I'd feel bad charging you a hundred for it and she's like well yeah but it's all this way and they're they're um they have this union agreement where they're not required to hire a union tax I mean the, the union wasn't going to be during like well you know if you're playing out in right podunk Michigan we're not going to make you hire a union guy from Chicago or whatever but the deal is they have to pay their tax union scale no more no less so it really didn't matter what I was quoting her. She it's, had it's still double what we normally <laughs> make in our day had, jobs, especially to show up with headphones. Um, so yeah, I got I got X amount of dollars just to mix it, which would have been crispy delicious anyway. Yeah. Then I got fifty cents a fifty five cents a mile. Yeah, government standard. Yeah, for a lot of miles <laughs> and, and uh, fifty dollar per diem times two because they were actually I don't know how that worked out, but it worked out. And then. They also generally hire a stage manager, but she says, you know, I really, you know, for taking this last minute, I want to hook you up. So if you'll advance the show for us, I'll pay you to stage manage too. And that's another X hundred dollars, hundreds of dollars. So I'm like, yeah, sure. And advancing this show would have basically amounted to calling the venue and say, uh, yeah, you got a stage? Uh huh? Okay. Does it look sort of like what you put on the picture? So is, it okay. a, is it a square or a rectangle? How many rectangles worth of stage is not, this? Not even that. I'm like, okay, so <laughs> there is a stage, and it is roughly where you said it would be on the diagram. Okay, is there a plug? Good. Goodbye. So, like, for the, and I didn't even, I didn't even have to do that. So, um, yeah, That's, they they brought the gear, they brought the fun. I just brought my guy, and I got ridiculously paid, which is awesome because we just, my family just incurred a truckload of out of out of. Whatever network. it is, out of network medical expenses. Yeah. So uh, that was, well, I'm, I'm halfway to, to covering a whopping great load of doctor bills. I'm just going to, just checking the time here. Oh, yeah, we got plenty of time. Oh, yeah. So, um, so yeah, that was that. That was that was the coolest road trip I've done in a long old time, and good friends met, and they are just super excited about us, and we're super excited about them. And We, we actually, uh, we were talking with them, and, and they're like, we, we would love to work with you guys again. We're like, yeah, we we'd love to work with you too. And the guy just looked at us like, "What are you doing next Wednesday?" I'm like, oh, well, we have jobs. <laughs> uh, he's like, "You want to drive down to Washington?" We're like, ah, uh, yes, but we have we have jobs. Yeah, but and no. Stuff. When I said, you know, my boss is cool, but he might not be that cool because yeah, I had already like, taken an unplanned week of vacation because I had to use up my days. Right. And then we did this, and I, so I went back and I told him, and he's like, you know. I'm exactly that cool. You just tell me what you need to do. <laughs> That's it, it. It really does. Like, I, both of our bosses are are wonderful. Like that. Like, uh, I I love working with Brian. I, I don't work at at your church, but it just every time I walk in, he's unbelievably cordial. Like, hey, you want some pizza? You want you uh, go out and grab you something to drink? What What do you want? And and having that kind of relationship with your bosses. Is unbelievable. If you don't work freelance all the time, we don't do that anymore. But my, my boss is the same way. I, I see her a few times a week and make her dinner every once in a while, which sounds weird because I'm married and she's got kids and she's married. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I cook for her kids' birthday parties and stuff. But she's she's along the same lines. You know, you get you get what you need to get done, and you do it well. And it's it's one of those. Uh, I remember them telling me this kind of stuff in 
you know, in, in youth group at church, you know, if you really want to get something out of your parents, do stuff that they don't ask you to, you know, you, you clean, clean the bathroom when you don't have to, all that kind of stuff. And it, it really does. It adds up. You, you've got these type of people that really actually value where you're going and, and what you're doing for them. It, it, it does make a world of difference how, how, um, how much you can cater to somebody else as much, as much as it seems like garbage and you don't want to go and pick their mail up and you don't want to go and, and, and help them out or, you know, pick up a coffee or whatever. But you'd be surprised how far just, just something like that goes in the long run where it allows you to get into this type of stuff that we, we got to do last week. Yeah. So yeah, big shout out to the bosses. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I don't want to crow too much, but yeah, my, my bosses specifically told me that I, as long as my stuff is done, he doesn't yep. care how much or little I'm there. And if anybody from HR comes around sniffing, he'll, uh, he'll oh, say, he just left five minutes ago. He'll say what needs to be said. <laughs> um, but that's cool. I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing I'm actually honestly there about four more hours a week than I get paid for. So when a week comes around that I need to miss a day to do stuff with the kids or go do a gig, then, uh, you know, like I don't, I don't feel the least bit guilty about it. And so far I've managed to keep on top of my stuff. So it's all working out great. So yep. yeah. And I definitely have man love issues with my boss and vice versa. <laughs> well, it's not a man, but that, that's that's where that's where the boss great, love the, issues. right yeah boss love <laughs> issues we've got my, my wife understands that that I've I've wanted to work for this lady since I was ten years old and uh, I work for her now and make her dinner every once in, in, in a while and stuff <laughs> all right so that's that's half the show um, that's a couple other things yeah we we have a uh, some grousing to do which we may or may not get to I may I may hold off on this until we have the other guys <laughs> we might do just a whole grousing about musicians slash performers slash participants in formal ceremonies it, it, but it, after gushing for half an hour about what a lovely time we had it, it almost seems wrong to go there at least right away right away yeah <laughs> I mean, it's like that seinfeld episode where Karen doesn't mind making fun of jewish people because well he's jewish now same type of thing i'm a musician carl's a musician brandon's a musician you played guitar i don't know what gordon did i feel like he might have dabbled he, with a drum machine or something. He was a big brass player in high school. Okay, yeah. So we, we've all played stuff and we've all dealt with people, and there's certain people you just can't deal with. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we'll we'll maybe come back around to that at the end of the show, just to give it some breathing room, or we may make a, a whole other show about it. Um, the other thing I wanted to get to, when I got to this on the blog, I, I started a little super original title for it, called it Sound 101, and I haven't been sued yet, but it's only been about 20 <laughs> minutes. Um Part of the reason I started the blog originally was just to sort of be a sound education for some people who are volunteering at the church. And I tend to work at a, a lot higher level than this is a microphone, this is a microphone cable. It's different from an instrument cable, um, that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm starting to do that stuff um, and do some of it on the blog. So I, I wrote a whole article about EQ and an article about compression. You can look those up. Um, click on the topics page and click on sound 101. You'll get all those topics. Uh, or you can click on the the EQ topic, or and, the, and there, there's a lot of stuff in there that even if you think you got it covered, um, you know, if, if you haven't been doing it for a decade or so, it doesn't hurt to just check up on. Like there, there's stuff that I know, but I've even gone back and read read a few things and I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. You you know how it works in your brain, but after a while, you, there there's certain stuff where it just helps to know the mechanics of it more than just knowing how it works in your head. If you need to explain it to somebody else or or uh, you got some volunteers or some new people coming in. Like this is this is why you do something, as opposed to just we'll just turn this knob and uh, if it doesn't stop, then then give me a call. Yep, and it's uh, something I was taught in the theater department. We talked a little bit about this um, when we were talking about concepts. Um, you know, the professors would actually ask you this. They they do it around the draw drawing table, but also in the space. Just point to a light and be like, hey, what's why is that light there? What's what's its purpose in life? How does it drive your concept? And it it helps to put yourself on guard like that when you're doing things because it keeps you from falling into a rut. I mean, it's it's okay mm -hmm. to, you know, dial up the same reverb and, and EQ it the same way every time if you can justify it every time. Right. Um, so it's it's good to know, you know, real engineers know what goes on inside their gear, you know, possibly even right down to, you know, what electrons are doing inside of semiconductors and things like that. So I always encourage people to, um, you know, just to, to delve into their stuff and uh, learn the insides of it. So compression, um, just to give it to the verbal, because I know we have some listeners that listen and don't necessarily read the blog. We spent a whole podcast talking about compressors and didn't bother to explain how they work, and we were bandy bandying about terms. Talking like, about what stuff we liked and what stuff we didn't like, Yeah, pretty much. And, uh, so look that one up. That was fun. Uh, Carl has yet to weigh in on that. 
Um, oh, wow, this is funny. I'm, I'm actually going to, okay, let's say that. Something just popped up on my phone that we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, so anyway, a quick rundown on compression. What a compressor is, is basically like an assistant you can plug in to mind the volume for you. Uh, you set a threshold where you want it to start acting, and it listens to the program, and any time the program exceeds that threshold, it corrects it. It corrects it. It automatically starts to reduce the volume, and you can control how it goes about that. And the primary way that you control it is by setting the ratio. So if your ratio is set at one to one, when it exceeds the threshold, it's not going to do anything. It may color the sound a little bit because there is circuitry in there. Right. If you set the ratio for two to one, that means you have to have your input signal exceed the threshold by double. Well, well, or well, by you have to. It, it, yeah, this is tricky. Yeah, it, <laughs> you, it, and it only helps slightly to be looking at the the graphics. If the if your program material goes over threshold two, you get a one dB out, output or increase at the output. If it's four to one, you. Uh, it has to exceed it by four to get a one dB output. So the, the higher that ratio goes, the louder the input has to be to get a, the same change out of the output. Right. And, now, and, and certain stuff there, I mean, not not necessarily guidelines, but there's if if you're just touching a piece of gear for the first time, there are certain type of things like I I personally, if if I run two kick drum mics, I like leaving one of them, particularly the in mic with all the batter sound, I like leaving flat unless I've got the extra compressor for it. On the out, I like compressing it two to one because you still get that punch. And there's a point in the song where you really want that extra drive to it. And if you're compressing it four or six to one, you're not getting it. Right. Um, in, in vocals, I usually start about 3.1 in between 3.1 and four to one um, and work down from there. You got to listen to what your singers are doing. If they're, if they're singing the same note, the same, not necessarily the same pitch, but the same dynamic, the whole song, two point or, or, or two to one's really really a good place to get to because if there is something where they're breaking that threshold of where they're singing the whole song it probably means something if you got somebody that just wails like they're not they're not caring then then four to one's usually a better starting point at least yep and you can use them two different ways you can work that threshold knob and that ratio knob back and forth and on the ratio you know anywhere from you know 1.1 up to about four is you know light to moderate you know, the e yeah moderate the easy side of medium compression and then medium runs from four up to about eight. By the time you get up above eight or ten, you're really into limiting, um, and we'll get to that in a minute. A limiter is basically just—it's called a brick wall limiter. Right. You know, any nothing over the threshold is going to produce any increase in volume. And, and um, that, I mean, for, for certain stuff like certain movie type things, like that's that's what you want. You you want a, an actor to be able to yell and and still get a, a touch more, but. You want to stay within the confines of, of your mastering limit. At yep. the end. Yeah, limiting is something you want to use sparingly. You can use it a lot. I mean, if you want to just a ton of compression, set something up as a limiter, and it'll squash the heck out of it. If you um, got a guy that's beating the hell out of a snare drum, yep, but just brushes the cymbals lightly, that's that's somewhere where you want to you want to think about getting into that. Where you know, if he's on a real quiet verse, just killing the snare, and the cymbals really need to come through, then limiting might be a better option than, than just a two or three to four to one. Yep. And, uh, you know, limiting in most cases, you want to use it real sparingly. You want to set it up for your doomsday scenario. Um, and a lot of compressors have, well, some anyway, have a separate limiting circuit. Uh, it may actually operate the same circuitry, but it's a separate set of controls that lets you just set a threshold period. And that what, you know, even if you're compressing a vocal sort of gently, somebody drops a mic or lets out a random scream, uh, that limiter will kick in. Um, a lot of guys put them in place. You know, it's it, nowadays with all this digital control, limiters are sort of built into to all your downstream everything, electronics. Yeah. But going back a little bit to how you can make the threshold and the ratio work back and forth across each other, um, Anth was talking about doing four to one on a vocal. And uh, you know, if you have, uh, I would use a compression or a, a ratio setting that high if I had somebody that just sort of needed the peaks nipped off. Yeah. I would set my threshold fairly high if I was using. A higher ratio um, but what I like to do more often because I'm working in theater there's so much dynamic range it's not like you have somebody singing a rock number and they're they're right. driving and there might be some dynamic range to it but in the theater um, and in worship music too um, you, you get you get such a wide range I mean everything from you know a whisper right up to a full throated shout uh, I like to run the ratio lower but have it kick in a lot earlier so yeah. it's, it's so very it, smooth at that point right yeah you're not you're not once you get to a certain point you just you lose everything you see. It, it, there's a lot of, of visual interplay too if you see somebody that's really giving it everything and you're not hearing it 
there's there's a certain aspect to that where oh TV is notorious for that. I remember watching oh, yeah. an award ceremony and Creed or somebody was playing, and you know, singer steps up. I heard his first syllable, and then he was just cramming it so hard that those broadcast limiters literally took him right out of the mix. Was, he was, was it a limiter, gone. or was it just people not wanting to hear Scott Stapp? Well, that, but uh, <laughs> it was. You, Marvel you can, Mouth McGee. You, you can have it where, you know, some, when somebody really belts it, they can actually take themselves out of the mix. So it, it yep. needs to be used wisely. wisely. Um, you can do things like make the, you know, if you're compressing an entire mix, you can make it so the kick drum pumps the entire mix, uh, which can be done. It can be cool. You can do it for effect, or, you know, you might want to watch out for it, too. But um, to the, talk a little... Oh, go ahead. Oh, the, there's a lot of stuff you hear on the radio where, you know, before, before I really got into... Mixing a lot, you'd hear a lot of stuff where it just sounds like your eardrums are, are just kind of caving in on themselves when you're listening to the radio. And what, what that's from is is from people over compressing stuff. You know, the radio broadcast FM radio is notorious for over compressing and, and not even compressing, limiting. So you, you just you flip the knob all the way to infinity to one, and you set it pretty low, and then you pump the output gain. So the first note of the song that's just one note is the same exact volume as the the biggest, you know, the, the guitar solo at the end. Yeah, although that's not, well, in radio and, and, well, in analog broadcast, in digital it's not so much of an issue anymore, but that that's a necessity because of the limitations of the medium. Right. Um, it doesn't help that popular music, you know, if you look at the waveforms, all the songs are sausages. <coughs> yeah. Uh, there's no dynamics in them. Uh, and actually, something interesting I heard, uh, yeah. you know how commercials are always louder? Yeah. Come December, they're instituting a new format that's going to apply to every network and station everywhere and Europe's doing a similar thing to where there will be a limit and this is interesting uh, a new limit level set just for the dialogue really which makes you say oh well you know they'll still make you know the Music, explosions right they, but you can't if you you know it, it was crafty because they have to the, <laughs> the rest of the mix the music and the sound effects can be whatever they want which means you could still have an obnoxiously loud you know guitar hit or explosion in a car commercial but if you want the viewers to hear about the great deals on Cadillacs, you got to hold it all back. So commercials are about to. Now it's going to be like the commercials are quieter than everything else. You can actually That's put the remote down. Awesome. Um, <laughs> so going back to compression, uh, different ways you can use it. You can. I'm not going to explain inserts. You just if you don't know what an insert is, look it up. If you don't know what a subgroup is, look it up. We'll deal with that another time. That's in the the signal routing show. Yeah. You can insert a compressor on a single channel, which is great because it gives you very fine control over a single performer, but if you're mixing monitors from front of house, that compression is going to wind up in the monitor mixes, which raises the noise floor, which makes feedback. You know, it, it can make it easier for the performer to hear themselves, but can also, if you remove the dynamics, they keep pushing and pushing, and they're not getting any louder. And Right, and then you, you run into issues, and you, you have to, I mean, you obviously have to mix the house, but if you get... To a certain point where you, you've been mixing the same thing for a while, there's there's a certain almost grace level that you've got where you, where you know you can throw up faders to a certain level and be a little bit safe. You really, if you're short on time, you're short on practice time, especially where you don't get it. If you know where you're going, it's a, it's a good starting point at least, as opposed to if you're over not overdriving but over compressing everything and you got people just wailing because they can't hear anything that that throws off your safety zone. Yeah, yeah, it's a rookie mistake to, to throw a ton of compression on a live mix because uh, that's people go to shows because there's dynamics there. It's interesting. Right. And there's loud parts and there's quiet parts, and that that tickles all the pleasure centers in your brain. So moving on, what I like to do, um, I like to route a lot of stuff through subgroups and put my insert my compressors there. And what's nice is if you have a, you know a typical bar band, rock band, whatever playing out, you know they're doing Sweet Home Alabama. The lead singer is singing. He's barely touching that compressor if you've got it set right. It's maybe just taking the peaks off so that the, the loudest notes aren't hurting people. But then when the rhythm guitar player and the bass player step up on the choruses, instead of getting three times louder, it does get somewhat louder, but because they're driving maybe, into that compressor and making it work more... Maybe one and a half times. Yeah. It's, uh, the sound gets slightly louder and a lot wider, fatter. So you have yep. this big, lush harmony vocal, and then it goes away, and the the, vo the levels of it, you don't have to mix it. It just it, If you set it, it up right, it just does it. mixes it. itself. And what else is nice, too, is I've found that if you get your settings dialed in right, you don't ever have to look or touch the rack. If you get so you can hear it, if you want more compression on something, you just turn the channels up a little bit, and that makes the compressor work a little harder without making it much louder. Or if you just need more volume, then you turn up the groups. Right, and that that's a lot of stuff like that. That translates to recording too. I've I've run a lot of stuff. You know, if you got a bunch of background vocals or a choir, even um, 
the the individual channels that you're you're adjusting interpret a lot to the whole group setting. So if you've got a compressor set as an insert on a group um, when you're recording something, but you pull all of the individual groups or the, the individual channels down in that group, you're not going to touch the compressor, and it's gonna it's gonna start doing a lot of funny things and. You know, getting a lot of more, you, you dig more into EQ and individual channel compression is where if you control the group the correct way, it's not an issue. It, it, it'll it it'll work itself into the mix the way that it's supposed to. So a lot of it, if, if you don't, if you don't brick wall everything, um, it sounds more musical, really, in, yeah. the long, in the long run. Yeah. And uh, so moving on, the last couple settings that we want to talk about are... Um, there's usually a setting for the knee, which that means um, how quickly it gets into that compression. You can make it you know, like for drums. You want a hard knee. When you exceed that threshold, you want it to go. I got it. You want it to go right into compression and, and take care of that that fast sound. If it's vocals, you might want to engage the soft knee and have it sort of smoothly ease into compression, so you don't hear a sudden right. It's, it's not like a like a, a cheap gate door closing. Mm-hmm. And then the other two knobs that are on there are attack and release, and that has to do with how fast it starts acting and how long it holds that compression. So for a vocal, you actually want it to act fairly fast, but not too quick. And this is key, actually, for a lot of stuff. I mean, for drums, you want it to cut in a little quicker. For, for a nice dynamic change, like if you're building into a chorus and your singer is, is holding out a note and they've got a, a good vocal control and a good dynamic control where their vocal does get louder and it... it interprets into the song getting bigger mm -hmm. you don't want it to click on you know five milliseconds you want to you want to give it a little bit um and, and let them get into it and then once they hit the course you, you find out where that peak is that you want them to kind of top out at so it's not it's not overpowering you have to adjust their individual volume control and throw off the compressor yep and uh but you want to watch in well the release time is important uh because right. you can that'll that's another thing that'll make the mix pump um, or make things sound unnatural, uh, which you might want to do. I mean, it's an artistic choice, but yeah. there, are, there are ways to make it sound natural, and there are ways to make it bad and ways to use it as an effect. The attack, though, is the real critical one, and if you don't understand what you're doing, hit the automatic button, <laughs> and that'll kind of <laughs> listen to your program, and it, it takes a root mean squared average of the program yeah. material and kind of sets itself appropriately. But um, a little side deviation here. If you uh, do this, if you don't believe me, the attack of a sound defines it for yep. you. So if you play, like take a recording of a trumpet playing a single note and holding it out, a piano playing the same note, violin, electric guitar, I pick the instrument, it doesn't matter. Line them all up side by side, you know, five second long samples or whatever, chop off the first half second of each one and then solo them one at a time and hit play. Really hard to tell the difference. Yep. Um, the attack is everything. Your attack, it tells your brain what it is that you're listening to. I mean, it's ridiculous, like to the point where you can't tell a tom apart from a piano note. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's I, uh, we. Uh, my wife is recording a project, and we got this this phenomenal. He he has a master's degree in percussion from Temple University. He he's um, hired professionally by a by a major Christian recording label. He's just <laughs> we did two takes for each song. Um, and he was done just because I wanted to hear him play different stuff on a chorus. <laughs> like, there's drum editing doesn't exist. I haven't I haven't even touched elastic time. Like, not not even a bit. Like, there's there's one hit that I made wrong playing bass because it's the first time I played the song. But uh, <laughs> but other than that, you, you've got guys that that can naturally um, change their dynamic, and, and you don't want to you want to crush that. Like, if there's a guy that actually knows. Especially jazz music, or, or more, actual more stuff with more music in it than rock and, and pop music. There are guys that actually do know what they're doing, and you don't want to cut that off. Like if there's there's a jazz group you're mixing, there's a reason they're going to get louder at a certain point in the song. It's not because they just don't know what they're doing anymore. It's because they're they're actually getting more intense, and they want that to portray to the audience. You don't want to cut that off too short and make it sound like a like a uh, Lady Gaga set where everything's <laughs> the same volume, but even her live shows are there's a lot of dynamics in them. But yeah, right, just yeah. watch watch that attack time. Like to to picture it acting on a drum, you want it to let through that initial smack and get all that nice stick sound on the head, yep. and then compress the body of the sound, that nice ring of the tom, and then gently let go get so it. That it doesn't sound like it's and pumping. Or you make it pump, but do it on purpose. Yeah, and then the, there's after that you get into gates and stuff like that mm -hmm. where you want the initial tom hit and the, the 
the guy that I, I was I was working with had a I talked about the kit before Yamaha Maple Custom. We're just you can't make it sound bad. Like if you put heads on it, it's gonna sound good, and you want you want the resonance of the drum. There are a lot of bands that you play with, you know, guys with cheap makeup, Mapex kits or D drum and all that stuff where you just you want the hit, you want the attack, but there's there's a musicality to it too. If you've got a guy with a nice drum set or a nice nice bass rig, nice guitar rig, you want to be able to hear what the actual instrument's doing. It's not your job to to adjust the musicality of what they're doing. You you want to be able to let them get through what they want to get through, but at the same time control the mix. So there's I guess it's a little bit of a gray area where you, where you want to get into controlling the show, but at the same time letting the musicians breathe um, and letting them get through what they want to get through. Mm -hmm. And let me think what else. The last thing we're going to talk about is the makeup game, which um, because you are reducing the volume, and if you push up the channel more, you'll get more compression and reduce the volume further. Uh, compressors all have a knob to let you account for some of that volume that you've lost. And uh, again, do an A-B, like go into a recording program or, or split them. Everybody probably heard that. <laughs> Sorry, dudes. <laughs> Just rubbed mosquito blood all over my work laptop. Um, if, you, if you take the same signal, feed it uncompressed, and then compress the other channel, uh, if you adjust the makeup gain, you, you wind up with a higher average level. So it sounds fuller without being physically louder than the initial track. Right. Um, so that's about all of that. And, um, yeah, there's a whole lot you can do with that. I mean, that doesn't even touch, uh, you know, compression on an overall mix or compression on a system, compression on elements of a system, and uh, multiband compression, which is an amazing mastering tool. Oh, my tool. God. Ugh. Yeah. It makes, it makes everything easier. There's, I mean, one of, I, I'm, I'm fairly against it. Um, there are certain situations that it works, but on an overall mix, if you really want to get something down to, to mastering level, but you still want it to sound big, multiband compression is great. You know, there, there are certain, your, your low lows, you want to compress a certain level, your mid lows, your mid highs, and your highs, all different levels, because one point from, from pretty much 1K to like 4K are going to cut through and sound a little bit piercing, so you want to compress those a little bit more, but the top end air and the bottom end thud, you still want to have there and make it sound nice and full. But if you overcompress certain aspects of it, you just get this flat sounding mix where there's no definition. Right. It's it, all there, but there's it's, no definition. It, everything sounds like a pair of iPod earplugs. earplugs. And uh, so anyway, to, to elaborate just a touch, multiband compression divides the entire spectrum of sound up into groups, you know, three, five, eight, however right. many you want yeah. if you're working in a DAW. Or you can set it up yourself with a crossover and a number yep. of compressors. There are boxes that you used to sell the, uh, the vocal finalizer, or no, the finalizer. Who was that from? BBE or somebody, yeah. Um, you know, it was multiband compression in a box from, from back stuff. in the day. Yeah, um, it divides the, the spectrum up into blocks, and then you can compress each block separately. And another cool uh, divide and conquer trick is um, mid side. You can take a stereo signal, run it through a mid side processor, and it will take all of the information that shows up equally in both channels and give that to you in one track, and then everything that shows up on the left and everything that shows up on the right. Yep. You can then EQ and compress those elements separately, then recombine them into a stereo signal and put them back together, and that right. is cool. Yeah, it, it, it adds a, a certain depth and, and, and I guess, girth to, to what you're putting out. You said girth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're getting close on time. Um, I like to try and keep it to an hour. The, the last thing I want to bring up today, and I got a text message from this, I wrote an article about uh, a cheapo mic that I bought for work, uh, the MXL 4000, jet, or a Chinese knockoff. Um, bang for the buck. I, uh, yeah. there, you really, there's not a better cheap microphone. There are a lot of terrible cheap mics around, but if you're going to buy a cheap mic, I, I can really say a lot for the MXLs. I needed a large diaphragm condenser microphone, uh, multi-pattern, that is, it would do cardioid, figure eight, and omni, that I was, one, not afraid to hand to the intern, <laughs> and two, not afraid to take outdoors, because I want something nice to capture, you know, either an omni or, um... If you set a figure eight microphone up with another directional condenser microphone, you can actually do some really cool things spatially, and we'll we'll do yeah. another talk about I'm that. At, I'm, at, I'm doing that uh, tomorrow. I've got a piano recital, and um, one of the neat things I learned was for for grand piano micing, setting them up right on top of each other, omni on bottom, figure eight on top, and there's there's this cool you you flip one of the mics out of phase, and the volume control controls the volume, but it also controls the width of the piano. It sounds 
the more you push the volume, the more it sounds like you're sticking your head right inside of it. If you got a great piano that's really well in tune, um, it, it adds so much to it, especially if it's if piano's the only instrument, mm -hmm. you know, the whole lot of other stuff messing around with it. Um, it, it adds a, an awesome depth with, with people that can play correctly and play dynamically, where when the piano needs to sound bigger, it sounds bigger instead of just increasing the volume. Yep. So, um, so yeah, I bought a $200 microphone, and I'm not going to try and say that it sounds like it's, yeah, it's multi-thousand dollar counterparts. It's not, a, it's not a U67, but in a live setting, um, yeah, for the I'm, kind of stuff we're doing. I'm not scared to take it on stage. In fact, I took it out. Uh, I, I got a barbershop quartet singing into it nice. this week. Uh, we did voiceover work for some, some video announcements that we do on our service. My boss used it uh, for recording some voiceover stuff and for doing a, a reading on a track for his album. And uh, we're having a blast with it. Like, it really doesn't sound bad. I, and I haven't figured out. There was a touch of noise in it, um, but I think that actually might have been coming from my cheap uh, USB <laughs> interface. I have a better interface coming next week. Uh, and actually, through the Midas at so work, I. I, I had not a bit of hiss. Getting myself a little nice little focus right four yeah. channel. We use that for everything. Like da Daddy might need one of those. I'm getting a uh, a Motu eight by eight for work, but I think Daddy might need a nice little focus right for my own for, work. For three hundred bucks, might as well. Boy, can you not go wrong? Ugh. So anyway, what the deal is with with MXL? Um, and I, I've heard a lot of guys talk about these, which is why I, I kind of know a little bit about them. I don't know this from personal experience, but um, they don't make a direct knockoff of another mic. They they design a mic with a purpose, and they're, they're pretty good at manufacturing. So it's actually probably, if it was to be built in the U.S. in small runs, they would be more expensive mics. Yeah. But, you know, they're, they're built in sweatshops by four-year-old children. And uh, and they cost less, just like your Nikes. Yeah. Yep. So, <laughs> actually, I, I don't know. Nikes but, aren't that much cheaper. There's there's a Flight of the Concord song about that. Check it out. Yep. So uh, <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking of. The, uh, so, like, they have a mic that's called uh, the, I don't know, the M87, which is not, like you would think, it's a not, knockoff of the Neumann 87. Um, it's, it was sort of designed with some different parameters in mind. However, they do have a copy, and I'll let this, I've let this slip a couple times on the blog. I have heard. I have not heard for myself yet. But if you get an MXL M63... For less than three hundred dollars, you can have a mic that is eighty percent as good as a Neumann eighty-seven. Congratulations, you just saved yourself thirty-two hundred dollars. Right, and especially if you like, if you take that out on the live stage, yeah, for, your guitar it, player can knock it over, the intern can drop it, it whatever. It's and it, it still usually works. Yep. <laughs> So yeah, I, I had a really good experience with it. Uh, I also actually, you know what? I will link to it. Uh, the voiceover stuff that we did wasn't terribly impressive because we don't have real voiceover talent. Um, it was just me and, <laughs> and one of the youth pastors doing the announcements. But um, I got uh, our assistant worship pastor is a, a pretty good guitar player and has a really nice acoustic guitar. And we just, it, it's not like an album ready piece. I was like, Darren, acoustic guitar, stage now. So he uh, <laughs> he jumped up with a big grin on his face, and you know, because anytime you mention acoustic guitar, he is right there with you. He's he is a beast. Um, but we went out, and uh, I will uh, for those of you on YouTube, look down in the description. Um, I'll link to the blog post. Uh, those of you looking on the blog, look under the window you're looking at right now. Um, I'll link to a file. I will give you. I did the first passage um, A B. I had the the MXL um, right on the sound hole, about a foot away. And I had a, an AKG 430 uh, at about the 12th fret yep. and did a recording like that. And I played it back for him. I'm like, all right, this is what it sounds like when they're both straight up. This is what it sounds like when you pan them hard out. Mm -hmm. And that was neat. You got a little, oh, yeah. it was really a pretty similar sound in both directions. But the left side was a little boomier. The right side was a little stringier. A little more definition. Yeah. And it was, it was still just one guitar. But it was like how you, you wouldn't ever hear a guitar that way. So it was a, a neat way to address it, and it would be a neat way to build it into a mix. Yep. Um, and then I had him play the same piece again where I threw... Uh, the first pass was with the, the MXL in cardioid mode. Threw it into figure eight mode, twisted it sideways, put the 430 right over top of it, and I moved them both so they were... Uh, about even with the... Not right at the sound hole, but closer, a little bit closer to the neck. And um, took another pass like that. And then this is that mid-side technique. This is how you can build a mid-side effect on your own. I took the, the directional mic, the, the 430, and put that straight up the middle, and then took my uh, figure eight mic, doubled the track, threw one of them out of phase, 
Yep. And then you can pan those out to the left and the right, and it's another weird thing. It's it's all still just one guitar, and it's very present in the middle, but there's this amazing space out to the sides there, because there, there's a chorusing effect, but it doesn't sound out of tune like a normal. And, right, and it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't really sound like a chorus. Yeah, it's like a very clean effect. Yep. Um, because what it is, when the signals are added back together at the stereo bus, you get the effect of on the left side you're hearing the center mic plus what the figure eight was hearing and on the right side you're hearing the center mic minus what the center mic was hearing so one side uh the, the plus side does get a little hotter so you got to yeah. mix that down you got to watch your levels and mix that down it, it depends a lot on how how <laughs> accurate your figure eight is yep and and too it can depend a little bit on dynamics too if he's, yep. if he's big and boomy at one point and then light and picking at the other point it the the weight of it depending on the frequency and the volume can actually change sides Yes, and that's amazing too. To, to just have this guitar, like, wait a minute, it's it's there, it's right there in the middle in front of me, but it's it's also there out there. And I'm, I'm pointing like way out to my left, or right, and yeah. it's moving around a little bit, but it's still in the middle. Right there's that that track that I showed you that it was teaspoon where we were we were looking at waveforms on uh, a double bass, and uh, there there's this he just had a pickup on it. I didn't I didn't like it or anything, but um, if you're looking at a waveform in in a DAW. It pulled a hundred percent to one side and then pulled a hundred percent to the other, and it's got this just awesome circling effect where mm. you're totally just encompassed in the bass and it goes away and it comes back and it's it's almost like being on a roller coaster. And I'm not sure you would get that with a mic. No, I, I think it's it's something specific to to his bowing pattern and what string he's playing. But it, at the same time, there's there's you know if there's nothing else going on, you're just listening to that. It's, it's it's an it factor type thing, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, I will um, look below for the link. I will give you one file that will have four samples in it. The first one will be uh, the A B. Actually, it'll be a bunch of stuff. It'll be it'll be the A B <laughs> straight up. Both mics pan straight to twelve noon. Then uh, A B with both mics panned out hard left and right. There will be just a smidgen of compression on there. You will hear a touch of noise because my uh, the A C was running and my mic pre is a touch noisy. Um, by the time I got the gain up there, and it won't be as loud as the records you used to your your, your MP3s, kids, because I'm not going there. Um, <laughs> so it'll be straight up AB, and then AB panned out, and then you'll hear MS straight up, and then panned out, and uh, it'll be just those four things. Uh, I'll give you. Oh, it's not a very big file. I mean, you could listen to the whole <laughs> thing. Uh, it'll probably be two minutes worth of listening. So I'll, I'll give you the, the piece. 64-bit, 192K. <laughs> it's going to take you an hour and a half to download I only, 30 seconds to listen to. I only to. recorded it. My interface only <laughs> only does 16-bit. But oh. I'll, I'll give you that to listen. Spend two minutes listening to that and, and think of the possibilities. Um, and then think about why you're not spending $200 on one of these mics. Yeah. That, um, one, of, one of my good buddies, um, he runs one of the bigger studios in town, and he's got a fantastic room for drums and he uses these old groove tubes mics but for everything else he's just got he's got the mxl locker which mm -hmm. is very i mean in terms of you know put next to the i think it's the it's the m80 i don't know whatever it is it's it's like a 3700 hundred dollar neumann vocal mic that's if you roll your fist up um it's about the size of that for the diaphragm and the top um He's got that that he uses on guitars, and then if he doesn't like the way that sounds, he goes right back to a three hundred dollar MXL, and that usually does the job. So I mean, if you're if you're literally cutting ten percent down your cost, but you're bettering your performance by five five or ten times, that's it's something that's not bad to get into. Like I I had the luxury of getting into when I started my job a, a few thousand dollars worth of really nice mics, but if I had to start from scratch, I would, I would do the same thing get the same nice sounds out of it and if, if if you can't get a nice sound out of a mic that's designed that well um it's not usually the mic or the pre there's there's usually something else in between your ears that you you really need to 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 work on and, and at least try and better yourself a bit to get something nice out of something cheap yep and uh actually i, I got one of the comments on the blog post i did about it was from uh, our buddy brandon and uh he he likes the MXLs too, and also said uh, sort of a midway, um, you know, looking at a thousand dollar copy of a uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight thousand dollar mic, uh, Mojave yes. is the brand. I've never actually heard any of their stuff, but I've I, heard of them. I think those are the Royer guys. Ah, 
Um, the Royer ribbon mics are fantastic. If you got a little bit more cash and you, you do more studio stuff, they they use them on everything. They use them on Tool and Queens of the Stone Age and some of the big pop records. There's just there's a neat ribbon mic sound that you've gotten. I'm almost positive that um, Royer's division of microphones that goes towards large diaphragm condensers is Mojave. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Well, that's uh, that's about all the time we got. Yeah, we're just over an hour, so that's all it'll fit on my paltry free server space for right now. Um, actually, uh, something semi-exciting happened. Uh, B&H Photo Video uh, spotted the blog and hit me up to be an affiliate, which I think means... If I put their links, you know, their banners on the site and somebody clicks through one of them and buys something, I get 12 cents. Do it. We can feed our families. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, I, um, yeah, I'm going to, I went ahead and did it, not because I'm hopeful of making money. I, I blogged extensively about family and parenthood for a couple of years, uh, hundreds of posts, and had Google AdSense engaged the whole time, and I made in that time the princely sum of twelve dollars and eighty-six cents. But we bought some jelly. Well, no, Google doesn't pay out until you make a hundred bucks. So oh. <laughs> I'm gonna have to. Oh. I have no, to no jelly. It's I have good. to. Your wife makes. Yeah, jelly. I have to blog for another hundred and fourteen years before I'm gonna make any. <laughs> before I'm gonna see that first check. Um, so I, we're not in it for the money. If, I mean, if I ever did get some payout for something like that, I would, I would obviously roll it right back into actually buying. Good, good server space for our stuff so that we could actually have bandwidth. Um, but anyway, uh, thanks for listening. Sorry we missed it last week, but it is the busy season, so we will, um, we will be here if we can. And if not, just know that we will be out there turning the knobs and pushing the faders. Wanted to say, uh, before we wrap up, just a quick hello. Um, being that we spent half the podcast talking about them, I'm hoping I can persuade some of the water coolers to swing in and listen to us extol their virtues. So if you're still listening at this point, just wanted to say a special hello to uh, Mike, Ryan, Brooke, and Kevin. Had a blast. Can't wait to see you guys again. And, and uh, Tom. Tom and, and Sally. Wife. Yes, Sally. Lovely time. We'll probably see them every time because they right. traveled the show. And uh, yep. we're looking forward to meeting the rest of your cast and can't wait till the next show. And also thanks to everybody who contributed. Want to also encourage anybody else who's out there listening or and or reading to contribute. Um, we are not nasty. We will not bite. Uh, do not fear for posting on our blog because I will not tolerate trolls. Uh, if anybody, yeah, we, we don't like Gordon reply to stuff. Yeah, he's uh, <laughs> he's not allowed unless he's been drinking. Um, but yeah, we just you know if, if if nastiness crops up in the comments, we're just not going to tolerate that. We'll just we'll delete stuff and ban people because we want this to be a, a place to discuss things and learn things, and we also don't want people to feel intimidated. If you really don't know a whole lot, uh, by all means, ask us. We love to talk about this stuff. We'll jump on email or get on Skype with you. Absolutely, uh, we we would love to take half an hour or an hour out of our busy days and <laughs> and talk audio with you guys. If you can um, get me out of a ceiling for anything, please. Please do. <laughs> and also, too, I, I'd love to challenge you. We haven't had any takers yet for people volunteering to come on the podcast, but uh, even if you just got a little home studio, um, we'd, we'd love to talk to you about what you're doing, what you're working on, what your thoughts are, and maybe give you some ideas. And I would challenge people to submit uh, a post for the blog. We're, we're 150 posts in, and the uh, the fountains are frankly drying up. <laughs> it's uh, we we've, we've sort of written out all our big ideas and we're we're kind of running low on stuff and we don't really want to cover the same stuff again right away. But uh, or even if you just have some ideas, if there's something you're a little curious about, uh, by all means, by all means, hit us up. We're easy to find. Uh, click on one of the authors on the blog. Hit our emails. Leave a comment. Look us up on Facebook or Twitter. Um, yeah, I think yeah. Leave comments on the on the YouTube stuff. Uh, so get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you and uh, and field any questions, a response, whatever, uh, whatever. <laughs> it's, <coughs> it's time to go. My, yeah. my, my ass is numb from sitting on a log. That's why I